Good evening, everyone. My name is Stephanie Sihuko, and I'm a professor in the Department of Art Practice at UC Berkeley. We are so thrilled and honored to host artist, writer, and MFA alum Connie Zhang to the Wiesenfeld Visiting Artist Lecture Series in the Department of Art Practice. This event is part of a series which is supported by the Office of Berkeley Arts and Design, a campus initiative that connects and fortifies the creative units throughout the Berkeley campus and in Bay Area Regional Collaboration. a and co-curates a range of public lecture series, including a and Mondays, every Monday evening in collaboration with many departments and centers on campus. Funds for these projects are made possible by a and and by generous philanthropic donations. Today's lecture is also supported by BAM PFA. I also would like to announce the next Wiesenfeld Visiting Artist Lecture, which will take place on Monday, November 2nd. Artist Lava Thomas and Kenyatta A.C. Hinkle will be speaking on the topic of monumental public art and protest at 6.30 p.m. As we gather today, we also acknowledge the land on which UC Berkeley stands, and hence the land on which this gathering takes place, even if we do so virtually now. UC Berkeley is sited on the ancestral and unceded land of the Ohlone people. We acknowledge not only the rich history of the Ohlone land, but also that the Ohlone people are active members of the Berkeley community and the Bay Area. I also would like to acknowledge that the fall 2020 semester of the Wiesenfeld Visiting Artist Lecture Series is curated by Kenyatta A.C. Hinkle. Hinkle's curatorial approach highlights artists whose creative practices explore issues concerning the intersections of social justice, healing, and the politics of belonging. I would now like to introduce tonight's guest. Connie Zhang is an artist with an expansive, incredibly prolific, and wide ranging practice. She produces copious amounts of creative material from artworks that encompass sculpture, drawing, installation, and video to written poetry, essays, and critical theory, all in the pursuit of narrating potential futures amidst both environmental and socio-political collapses. These are tough topics that at times feel insurmountable. How do we as individuals, as communities, and as a species reckon with what we have wrought on this earth and on each other? How do we begin to dream differently and tell stories about resistant futures? In her words, Zhang seeks to expand the language of climate apocalypse and the racialization of contamination narratives. By using seeds as both metaphor and potent symbol, she asks us to consider how even small things can be powerful leverages of not just genetic code, but can carry forward hybridized realities and speculative possibilities in order to see past the smoke and mirrors of late capitalism. Zheng was born in China and is currently based in Oakland, California. She has exhibited work at the Berkeley Art Museum and Pacific Film Archive. AIR Gallery in New York, and Minnesota Street Project in San Francisco, among others. She has received fellowships and residencies from the Headland Center for the Arts, Acre, and the Vermont Studio Center, and will be publishing a chapter in the upcoming Rutledge Companion to Contemporary Art, Visual Culture, and Climate Change. She received an MFA in Art Practice from UC Berkeley, as well as a BAs in Economics and English from Brown University. And on a personal note, I might add, it was an absolute honor to work with her during her time as a graduate student at Cal. Zheng is currently an award, awarded graduate fellow at the Headland Center for the Arts, a collection fellow at CADIST and the art director of Quiet Lightning. And if all those degrees weren't enough, she most recently started a PhD program in visual studies at UC Santa Cruz this fall. I truly can't wait to see what she presents for us tonight. Please join me in welcoming Connie Zhang. Hi. Okay. How to talk to seeds. 
In March and April, those early pandemic months, the only news articles that did not seem to consistently freak me out were pictures of friends' gardens and advice for starting your own pandemic garden. A Google Trends search for seeds shows that the keyword reached its all-time high in interest since 2004 by early April of this year. In late March, the New York Times reported on a run on seeds as legions of Americans went on a toilet paper and seed hoarding spree. If we were together in person right now, I would ask how many of you started a garden for the first time this spring as a result of quarantine. I would consider myself one of those people. Over the past year and a half, I've been working with seeds, mostly in a conceptual capacity. I've been drawing seeds, painting seeds, making a three-part film about seeds, writing about seeds, reading about seeds, populating a VR greenhouse, studying seed catalogs and maps and examining dried seed specimens, even asking people to make seeds with me out of clay. Yet during this time, I knew very little about actual planting, about what to feed a seed, how to coax it out of dormancy. Like so many people, I started my own garden for the first time this spring, growing simple and hardy herbs, greens and flowers, I will share more about my seed related projects in the second half of this talk. Rather than my amateur gardening practice, which is not much to speak of, I'll focus mostly on my love of and fascination with seeds and the incredible conceptual power they contain for me, especially as a body through which to consider environmental aesthetics, apocalypse and survival, locality and invasion, and radical futurity. This summer, as the Black Lives Matter matter uprisings began to spread across the US to become the largest social movement in our country's history. I was also struck by the explosion of botanical imagery and references to seeds of change. I remembered several lush flower boxes at George Floyd Square in Minneapolis this August, which seemed to be living symbols for the resilience and potency of the movement, as well as its eruptive and revolutionary power. I was captivated by botanical themed protest signs with slogans such as resistance is fertile, and drawings of decommissioned police cars erupting into bloom. Perhaps in a nod to Angela Davis's famous observation that radical simply means grasping things by the root, seeds and planting have a long history of being used as symbols of change and revolutionary reimagining. It is a visual history that I don't think I would do justice to by covering in such a cursory manner here. And so I'll only touch upon it briefly. Off the top of my head, I'm thinking here of the work of the Just Seeds Printmaking Network, as well as Pedro Reyes's Palas por Pistolas, Guns for Shovels project, in which the artist invited residents of Culiacan, a city in Western Mexico, to trade in 1,527 guns, which were destroyed and reforged into gardening shovels later and used to plant 1,527 trees, mostly in the Culiacan region. There are too many other examples of using seeds as a material of political economy to discuss at length here. Future Farmers, Multi-Year Seed Journey Project, Vivian Sensor's Palestine Seed Library, Ellie Iron's Next Epic Seed Library, Stephanie Sihuko's Empire Gardens Project, and Mar Mary Mattingly Swalley, to list just a few. And of course, Agnes Dennis and her wheat field works. I mentioned these works in passing as anchors for myself as I continue to develop my own work around seeds and gain confidence as a gardener and grow. Outside the realm of contemporary art, whatever that term means to you, mythology, folklore, and botanical history reveal countless examples of how seeds have exemplified hope and survival. Environmental and oral history famously tell of how certain strains of rice arrived in Brazil and the Southern American colonies as seeds woven into the hair of an African woman in 1726, a Swiss correspondent, Jean Watt, claimed that it was by a woman that rice was transplanted into Carolina. Other now established Southern staple crops, such as okra, watermelon, and various cereals and grains, to list just a few, were also documented to have traveled to the Americas from Africa through enslaved people who depended upon these foods for their survival and through these seeds pioneered the cultivation of foods familiar to them and which would later become a bedrock of American cuisine. C 
seeds, of course, occupy an enormous space as a symbol of new growth and the eruption of life in mythology and environmental history the world over. Entire books have been written about the wisdom of seeds and vegetal philosophies. Robin Wall Kimmer begins her monumental work, Braiding Sweetgrass, by sharing the story of Sky Woman, who fell to Turtle Island carrying a bundle of fruits and seeds, which she planted on a turtle's back and germinated into the many medicines, grasses, flowers, and trees that nourish us today. I understand the Sky Woman story to be Iroquois in origin, although I invite others to correct me. Over the course of Braiding Sweetgrass, Kimura writes compellingly about the ontological doors and new modes of interspecies mutuality that open when scientists enrich their research with indigenous knowledge. While I do not borrow from or reference um, any indigenous cosmologies in my own work, choosing instead to draw more from Chinese spiritual practices or objects, I mention her work as one of many um, primary resources for me in the study of seeds and their peculiar animacy and power. Like anything with the power to change the composition of a place, seeds have also been historically weaponized as a vehicle for displacement and colonization, as well as a symbol to exacerbate fears of takeover by foreign entities. Just to list a few egregious examples, the Dole family's imperialistic takeover of the land, political system, and economy in Hawaii via pineapple plantations is well documented. French and Spanish colonizers coffee plantations in the West Indies were famous for their inhumane working conditions and subjugation of local populations. And some historians attribute the economic success, success of Darjeeling tea plantations in India to a Scottish botanist theft of Chinese tea plants and seedlings. Sometimes the displacement is accidental if reckless and damaging. The Marin Headlands is blanketed with two beautiful plants, often erroneously thought to be native to California, eucalyptus, also known as Tasmanian blue gum, and the ice plant. Nothing could be further from the truth. They are invasives transported here from South Africa in the 1850s and early 1900s, respectively. Eucalyptus was planted in California for timber and fuel, whereas ice plant was planted as an erosion stabilization tool. Both are now widespread, threatening endangered local plants that cannot survive outside of California. A KQED article in 2018 called eucalyptus California's most hated plant, as they pose a serious fire risk and also modify local soil moisture and chemistry, among other environmental conditions. Personally, I am ambivalent about eucalyptus, and I often don't know what to make of the virulent language around its invasiveness which occasionally reminds me of the political language around invasive non-local peoples, many of whom did not come to a place by choice. How do we mourn, preserve, and celebrate at the same time? The strands of this research around seeds and botanical life as a body through which to consider migration, empire building projects, and the movement of global capital has coalesced into two recent projects. The first being a map that traces the ways in which common food plants in the United States have migrated over millennia and how many of the plants we consider native to a place are not actually indigenous, but imported via colonial enterprise. Meanwhile, an outdoor installation project 95 Spirit Tablets for Longevity draws upon the rare plants database of the California Native Plant Society in order to pay homage to the 95 endangered plants native to Alameda County. This homage takes the form of Chinese spirit tablets made from scavenged and repurposed pallet wood. And I have pointed any um, interested in potential uh, buyers of the tablets to donate instead to the Sogoria Tay Land Trust. I see both of these projects as prototypes of a sort, small scale explorations in combining familiar forms with extensive archival research in order to work through conflicting emotions around migration and locality, changing landscapes and my own complicity as a settler.
While not all of my work involves seeds, my current body of work is organized around the histories and migrations of seeds, as well as the ways in which plants embody humans' hope for survival and our fears of contamination and invasion. In my studio and research practice, I am broadly intrigued by the relationships between diasporic memory and home, the possibilities for expanding the language of climate apocalypse, as Stephanie mentioned earlier, and the racialization of contamination narratives as told through visual and text-based forms. These conceptual interests have been deeply informed by my experiences of growing up in the United States and frequently returning to China. And oscillating between the lush green forests of New England and the futuristic, as it's often called, or apocalyptic, deeply polluted urban mega centers of my birth country. I'd like to spend a few minutes now to dial in on the accretive and unspectacular violence wrought by climate disaster and environmental injustice and to talk about why questions of temporality feel so crucial to me. The image I'm showing here is, I think, not, is, uh, not exactly an unspectacular example. It's um, an image from uh, my aunt's balcony in Southern China. And as you can see, it is a, an amusement park right in the middle of the beautiful mountain range. Um, I, I like to use this as a sort of uh, counterweight or complementary image to um, conversations about slow violence. So what do I mean when I talk about slow violence? So when we see entire neighborhoods up in flames or the residents of a city falling ill from prolonged lead poisoning, the accretive qualities of resource plunder and extraction and violence against the land articulate themselves as the acts of slow violence that they are. In slow violence in the environmentalism of the poor, Rob Nixon defines slow violence as a violence that occurs gradually and out of sight, a violence of delayed destruction that is dispersed across time and space, an attritional violence that is often not viewed as violence at all. The invisibility of these long dyings, as Nixon calls them, speaks to the different temporal scales on which climate change and visible corporeal damage register. I'm going to switch um, my screen now to play a video that I'll be speaking over. Here, I invite a consideration of seeds as a framework through which to contemplate the possibilities of simultaneously occupying several different temporal registers about delayed manifestations and slow growth in the face of slow violence. Are seeds living? Are they dead? Are they alive and dead? During a very short lived stint as an informal K-12 science educator earlier this year, I used to play a game with students that I sometimes thought of as alive or dead. Anyone with a child under the age of six probably knows this game. The child points to a specimen and asks, is it dead? Cat, alive. Fur coat, dead. Fly in the corner, hopefully dead. The kids often found their ontology especially challenged when confronted with marine and botanical specimens. They would gaze at a petri dish of tomato seeds and ask, is it dead? And I would tell them that it was not living, but that it could be. Are acorns dead? Are kernels of corn dead? Are stalks of grain dead? If you can germinate them with water and soil 500 years later, or are they just sleeping?
The scholar Linda Yamane notes that in the Ramsian Ohlone language, there is a word, ochans, which I'm probably mispronouncing here, which translates to seed times. I could not find any information about the word on the internet, but I took this conceptualization as a point of departure to think about the time of seeds, of seed time. Seeds are inert and timeless as rocks, yet hold within them the possibility of revitalizing at any moment, shooting upwards into life. I conceptualize seed time as delayed time, staggered time, unpredictable, and slow time. There's a long visual history of sowing seeds as a motif for the delayed fruits of one's labor, although such images usually seem to center human workers rather than the seeds themselves. As anyone who has propagated a branch or succulent leaf knows, plants possess a talent for perpetuity. Like anemones, which are rumored to be equally immortal, although biologists seem to dislike that word, they can bird themselves over and over again, given the presence of sufficient nutrients and no predators. New arms growing on top of old arms, new legs on top of old legs, new brains on top of old brains until they are eaten, crushed, burned, or die of starvation. Perhaps it is the quietest, most unspectacular beings that will outlast all else. The evolutionary record seems to indicate such as evidenced by the continued existence of ferns and coelacanths, especially against the backdrop of the extinction of dinosaurs. But it is the dinosaurs who died so spectacularly, so totally, that capture our imagination and elicit periodic flights of romantic fancy, as suggested by the commercial success of the Jurassic Park movies. We do not mourn and fantasize about the resuscitation of the primordial rat or shrub. Lazy, glamorous pandas mobilize wildlife rescue campaigns, not ugly, industrious worms. We remain the society of the spectacle even more than we were during the time of Debord. I'm obsessed with the ways in which climate change produces representational challenges in relation to visibility and invisibility, privileging the circulation of certain kinds of voices over others and how the loudest voices tend to be those most keenly synchronize the spectacle. For one example, close to home, just look back to the photos of the orange California sky on September 9th, 2020. I keep on thinking back to the fiery orange sky of that day and see the day as it was inscribed on camera, my camera and the cameras of others. There were many pictures of the Golden Gate Bridge wreathed in burnt tangerine fog. There were many, many comparisons to the Ryan Gosling installation of Blade Runner. All of these images were too beautiful that any of them had a right to be, I think, including my own. I skimmed through the cascade of images on social media and I thought, was the sky really so photogenic today? Was this not literally one of the most disturbing days of my life? Beauty in the ashes on the orange hype, which is your favorite shade of orange sky? In the future, as crises of this kind erupt before us in every more violent cascades, will we, be, will we be too busy putting makeup on our apocalypse to actually be able to sit with it for what it is and to allow ourselves to see the monumental tasks of survival, mutuality and mitigation that are asked of us? And so in artwork, especially work dealing with climate disaster, I think pacing and aesthetics become a political decision. As Rob Nixon writes, the insidious workings of slow violence derive largely from the unequal attention given to spectacular and unspectacular time. I spent a lot of time looking at artwork and watching films about environmental disaster. Most of them are aesthetically striking, but leave me with a very bad taste in my mouth and a vague conviction that we're all totally doomed. It's crucial to me that we continue to seed ourselves with voices who push against this fatalistic and ultimately ideologically right-wing view. I think of Naomi Klein who notes that pop apocalypticism is so much a part of our culture that we think all we're capable of doing is becoming like societies portrayed in Snowpiercer, Elysium, or The Hunger Games. As she points out, it's actually not controversial to say this is where we are headed. Isn't there something very disturbing about that? That it's somehow normal for our pop culture to project a vision of a climate ravaged future where only a cisgendered, heterosexual, sometimes, but usually psychopathic white man or couple survives? When artists dealing with environmental disaster say things in interviews like, 
I was struck by the beauty of this open pit mine, or I wanted to imagine a future that included no humans. I always come back to TJ Demos and his critique of the photographer Edward Bertinsky's grandiose renderings of disaster. For example, here's an early print of Bertinsky's depicting an oil spill off the Gulf of Mexico. It is a striking image. The water is a terrifying sheet of liquid the color of tar. There is no depiction of the communities that might be affected by this, the animals that choke to death on this oil. Yet, as a viewer, are some of us not somewhat relieved that we are seeing the, the disaster from a helicopter's length away, far, far away? In his analysis, Demos critiques Bertinsky for his strong emphasis on the aesthetic pleasure of the petro-industrial sublime. As Demos argues, what the photographer constructs is the petro-industrial sublime emphasizing the awesome visuality of the catastrophic oil economy's infrastructure founded on obsessive capitalist growth. He argues that the problem with this approach is that such images tend to naturalize petrocapitalism, with the mesmerizing imaging machine enthralled to the compositional and chromatic elements of the very framework responsible for our environmental destruction. When pure visual gratification threatens to subsume or neutralize our ability to question the very causes, the things that are quickly and slowly killing us, it's worth stepping back to question and reconsider the visual culture we take for granted. So what are the possibilities for making work dealing with disaster, which invite participation and consideration while resisting the pull of pure aesthetic gratification? After all, is it not the romance, the drama of visuality that keeps us looking? How do we invite people to really look when we have been the society of the spectacle? for so long. Over the past few years, I've given particular attention to artists who produce research-driven work around catastrophe, who work to resist the pornification of atrocity while still developing a compelling and poetic visual language. James T. Hong is one model for me, particularly in his films dealing with germ warfare in China during World War II. James T. Hong's films, Lessons of the Blood, and opening, closing, forgetting, piece together interviews, extensive archival and field research, and TV footage addressing Japan's use of biological warfare and experimentation on Chinese prisoners during World War II, as well as the revisionism of the Japanese government and Chinese survivors' attempts to live with this horrific history and to find justice. The film is beautifully made, but not distractingly gorgeous. One of the things that particularly stuck out to me about Lessons of the Blood is that it also acts as a legal document, as Hong and his collaborator Yin Ju Chen's research and documentation were used to aid the survivors after an initial unsuccessful lawsuit against the Japanese government. In this sense, this work also reminds me of another work that is an inspiration for me, Ursula Biemann and Paulo Tavares's Forest Law. In Forest Law, Biemann and Tavares follow the efforts of the indigenous people of Sariaku for self-determination and environmental protection in the equatorial Amazon. Much has been written about this powerful work and all I will say here is that I see it as a kind of model in terms of filmmaking and video work. I've yet to interweave my interests in environmental justice and artistic practice in a way that feels seamless to me. And my own questions around various ethical aspects of documentary filmmaking and the institutional treatment of many justice movements make my own forays slow and cautious. But I return to my models time and time again and remind myself that powerful work takes time to make and seeds can lie fallow for a long time before germinating. My practice moves between film, video, text, drawing and painting and I draw heavily upon methods of assemblage and recontextualization. Each material allows me to access different semiotic ecosystems and enables divergent methods of thinking and seeing. Although I like to begin new projects by drawing because of its immediacy. And I like writing because it is a language that I can use to connect to a larger system of symbols and histories. These strands of my practice are currently coalescing in one of my more involved current projects, a film project titled The Lonely Age. I completed part one for my MFA thesis at Cal last spring, and I'm nearly done with a cut for, of part two. 
which I finished filming right before shelter in place went into effect. And I'll be showing it at the Headlands Graduate Fellowship show in November. So now I'd like to just take about three minutes to show a short clip from part one. Okay, I just realized there was no sound. Sorry, um, let me try that again. Thanks for chatting, Ron. Yeah, I heard the seeds have a glow. And that, there's something magic about them. I think they might be supernatural, to be honest. What would I do if I encountered one of the seeds? Or extraterrestrial, I mean. I mean, I'd approach it, or I don't know if I'd approach it. I think but I'd approach the I situation. Guess I, I like think I they're would, here to help. Um, encountering another human in the wild you know, or another animal of any kind, you know, I would enter the space respectfully and I think, you know, I don't want to disturb anything. That's like my thing. I just want I to go on my way and do uh, my thing. could be and, real. I want them to know, be real. Uh, and I think on. that they're made real by the belief that people have in them. And I think like religion, that believing in something that will solve so many of our problems is perhaps a necessity in times like these to keep people going. Maybe the seeds are invented by the bio corporations to prevent the total annihilation of hope and to prevent people from not even trying, not even, you know, not providing for their needs. I don't know if um, I whatever they believe are. them or not. So, I've heard a lot of stories I don't know about what the seeds are. Maybe, maybe you know, they're real, maybe people, they're not. All of a sudden uh, but, feeling better. Uh, I want to believe that they have magical powers. The cough finally leaving, you know? But this doesn't seem... doesn't seem possible. I will say this, though. If it's something to look forward to, then, you know, maybe that's good enough. Maybe that's all... Maybe, all, maybe that's the most important thing.
The Lonely Age is an ongoing three-part experimental film project about rumors of magical, potentially radioactive seeds that have escaped from a GMO factory in China. I gave my performers collaborative, improvisational games to play. And at its core, The Lonely Age is a metafictional film whose tension emerges from rumors of hope. Are the seeds real? Are they actually radio waste, radioactive waste from China? In a sense, it doesn't matter. The film is more about the power of belief in underlying ideologies that underpin our hoping and dreaming. None of the people providing the voiceovers actually believe that there are magical seeds that can cure all of our sicknesses or our radioactive waste from China, but they are using the tale of the seeds as a way to express their own hope or cynicism. In this way, the film's narrative action is driven by the rumors that I received from contributors. I gave all of the performers and uh, people who provided voiceovers a short story to read about the seeds. And I asked them to respond to a set of fake interview questions. The stories I gave them to read and imagine themselves as existing within are collected in an ongoing speculative seed catalog that I've been calling Millennium Flowers Catalog. I see rumors as living, breathing organisms that can mutate our shape and shape our reality. Earlier this summer, more than a year after I started working on The Lonely Age, a folklorist friend pointed me toward reports of people across the United States receiving over 8,000 unsolicited packets of seeds from China. As China continues to figure as a bioterrorist agent in the American political imagination, as evidenced by the Trump administration's persistent use of the phrase China virus, I see questions around media portrayals of contaminated others as likely to gain in importance over coming decades. I'm also interested in the ways in which the Chinese other especially seems to inhabit an invasive or contaminant quality when it goes into circulation, typically via living bodies or biological materials such as bats or seeds. In a way, I also think of the lonely age as an exercise for me in practicing the act of hoping and rehearsing for future survival. It is not supposed to be a convincing sci-fi film. I don't have the budget, the skills, or anything else you would need for it to be such. My assistant director and lead performer, Sharon Xiao, who comes from a theater background, once called this project a poor film, capital P, capital F, the cinematic equivalent of Jerzy Grotowski's poor theater, which is essentially a theater stripped of all superfluous elements such as set, costumes, props, and makeup. Grotowski uses the phrase poor theater to describe a performative method of proceeding via negativa, a performance based not upon a collection of skills, but rather an eradication of blocks to full expression of the spirit through the body and a performance in which the spectator sees only a series of invisible impulses. I really enjoyed that and think it is a generative way to describe the centering of informal, collectively produced knowledge, knowledge that drives the story of the film. In tandem with The Lonely Age, since March 2019, I've twice facilitated an ongoing um, for lack of a better phrase, social sculpture project called Seed Almanac, in which I invite members of the public to make seeds out of clay with me. In each seed making workshop, I have asked participants the following question. If you could have any seed with you at the end of the world, what would it be? Collaborators of all ages have created some extraordinary seeds, including strawberries, maize, spaghetti and meatball seeds, pizza seeds, money seeds, and heart-shaped seeds for building community. These speculative seeds have inspired many novel seed forms in my own drawings and paintings. And I see this project as a form of artistic dialogue. These workshops have also become avenues through which I've been able to have thoughtful, low stakes, fairly optimistic, to my shock, conversations with total strangers about climate change, drought-resistant agriculture, and what survival means to each of us. Here, I'd like to comment briefly on my interest in the speculative position as a mode of understanding and learning how to orient to a future full of unknowns. I read a lot of speculative fiction or sci-fi and treat it as research material for all of my work. 
with some particularly powerful inspirations shown here. When reading speculative fiction, I've sometimes found it helpful to perform a sort of ideologic litmus test in the course of reading. Do the sci-fi poetics in this work merely aestheticize crisis? Is the eco-catastrophic context generalized or specific? Is it inviting us to enjoy our own future demise as an, as an aesthetic distanced exercise? Does it vaguely wave a hand at the failures of the present without offering imagined alternatives or responses to its fiction's foundation. I'm not saying that all artwork needs to serve an ideological function. I'm just saying that lately, I've been responding more to work that positions some sort of political traction because the stakes feel so high. In writing about fascism and the aesthetics of war, Walter Benjamin noted at the end of the work of art in the age of mechanical reproduction, that mankind's self-alienation has reached such degree that it can experience its own destruction as an aesthetic pleasure of the first order. Octavia Butler's Parable of the Sower, as well as the Lilith's Brood trilogy and Ursula K. Le Guin's The Dispossessed are for me two, uh, three timeless counter arguments to Benjamin's proposals or prognosis. Parable of the Sower, Lilith's brood and the dispossessed in their attention to communal living formations, collective survival and radical eco-feminist politics, challenge and provide compelling aesthetically strong and memorable counter arguments to the empty speculative fabulation of most pop culture, apocalyptic sci-fi, which in my mind, perpetuate neoliberal ideologies of survivalism. And of course, the story of Parable of the Sower is rooted within an ideology of the seed as an agent of change. While I was working on part one of The Lonely Age last year, I also made a series of large scroll-like paintings on Mylar. The Mothers are metafictional altar paintings from the world of The Lonely Age, which I produced for my thesis exhibition at the Berkeley Art Museum last spring. The figures are intended to be speculative versions of the rogue seeds that have captured the imaginations of the people narrating the film. These images reference Chinese religious paintings of Taoist deities, many of whom are still kept alive in the memories of the Hokkien people in Southern China. The forms also borrow from photographs of vegetal matter, radiation deformed marine life and plastic waste. As I worked on The Lonely Age, I began to ask questions around what kinds of compromised bodily systems and interbody relations might arise at a time when most of the food grown around the world is augmented with hormones or laced with pesticide. The seeds or mothers of this world are therefore explorations of emergent forms of intermaterial entanglements and reckonings, which I also see reflected in the work of the writer Jeff Vandermeer and visual artist Marguerite Humo. I like to make paintings because they have a long semiotic history rooted in religious worship, archiving and documentation of a society's values. And they tap into a rich embodied language of mark making a material which can further tap into an experience of abjection by blurring the boundaries between subject and object. I like how flat the pictorial plane is in a painting and how total one's commitment to a worldview has to be in order to produce a convincing image. Earlier this year, I started working on a new series of paintings, a series of 13 seed atlas panel paintings on Mylar, each of which corresponds loosely to one of the 13 pages of the eighth century Dunhuang at star atlas. This painting, We Heard the Sky Used to Be a Field of Blue, is the first finished piece in the series with others currently in progress. Each of them stands at 60.5 inches, my height, and are still, uh, most of them are still in the research phase as they involve the long-term collection of data. This project is um, more uh, personal for me than some of my other paintings. It's, um, it's an environmental diary of sorts as, uh, as it is a way to sort of help me pictorially record um, the, basically how vast um, 
the wealth of ecological data is around us, around me, and how it can also be used as a tool for wayfinding, reconnecting to place and localized notions of home, hoping and dreaming. The plants shown in this image are plants I came into contact with on a regular basis from January to June 2020, as my movements became increasingly restricted. And I started a garden for the first time. These works emerge from an earlier video project that I spent most of 2018 working on. Oh, here's a detail. I forgot this is in here. So these works emerge from an earlier video project um, called uh, Notes of Fluorescence. From a scholarly perspective, this video sought to examine the ways in which narratives of ecological apocalypse were often outsourced to a Chinese other as an American rhetorical practice of obfuscating its own outsized role in global climate devastation and its willful neglect of communities of color back home. I am in the process of re-examining this narrative as I do think COVID has profoundly de destabilized mainstream American attitudes toward American exceptionalism, although obviously that's not the case across the country. On a personal level, notes on fluorescence was a way for me to grieve for my ailing grandparents and for the devastating changes I had witnessed in the landscape of my birthplace over the past several decades. I was born in China and I grew up in the Northeastern United States. Returning, I uh, have, have a complicated relationship with that word, um, to China every summer. Lush, leafy forests and acres of concrete skyscrapers have long occupied simultaneously for me the site of home. I grew up with neighbors asking me if I spoke English, relatives in China telling me I was a foreigner, and never knowing how to answer the question, where are you from? A lot of my work is an attempt to understand how a chimerical, unbounded, and fluctuating idea of home, especially as climate change, changes our idea of what is a safe home space or not. And how that, how that sense of unbounded sense of home can change from a sense of otherness and loneliness to one of powerness, power and imagination. I see my explorations in time-based media, particularly as rooted in the curiosity about what happens when multiple time scales intersect. And I wonder if time can act as alchemist equalizer and collaborator. The more I think about seed time, the more I want to link it to the practice of making artistic work. Anyone who has tried to germinate seeds probably knows that the germination time in the packet does not always bear out in reality. Similarly, when I make work, I often have no idea what I'm making as I make it, and I still don't know what it is for a long time after. Sometimes too, I think about seeds as a form of biological propaganda a body through which to disseminate reproductive material, the material of life, to propagate, to multiply, to reproduce, to transmit. Like propaganda, whether political or personal, visible or invisible, seeds can lie dormant for a long time before taking root and emerging, ready to shoot upwards or join forces with other beings. I don't believe all propaganda is necessarily bad. I think there can exist good propaganda alongside harmful propaganda, propaganda that can seed the conditions for collective flourishing nourishment and growth. Naomi Klein argues that knowing how to slow down strategically can enable our ability to observe climate change, the subtle changes accumulating in landscapes and bodies before it's too late. She argues that it, in fact, can actually contribute to our sense of urgency. I extend Klein's argument by suggesting that considering multiplicities of temporalities, often buried or invisibilized, beyond modern capitalist time, beyond a sense of time tethered to apocalyptic spectacle, can actually help us develop the kind of knowledge, sensitivity, and awareness required for living through the Anthropocene, Capitalocene, Trumpocene, whatever you want to call it. I like the thought of using seeds to develop new perspectives on approaching many of the most challenging ideological crises of our time. The necessary antidote to slow violence if such a thing is possible, a sustained process of hope and being able to sit with the unknown. Hope in the sense that Rebecca Solnit frames it, hope as that which locates itself 
from the premises that we don't know what will happen and that in the spaciousness of uncertainty, there's room to act. A deep kind of hope in the words of the philosopher Andre Willis, a kind of hope that can manifest as something as simple as togetherness, entanglement as synonymous with the quality and depth of commitment to oneself and their community. This is also a view of time that centers the body, centers its strange peelings and changes, the electricity of touch. A view of time that refuses boundaries between subject and object, alive and dead, dream and future unspeakability. The seed too is a body, a body constantly on the verge of wakefulness and action, both absence and fullness, biding its time and sometimes sprouting before outside conditions are truly ready to receive it. So that's it. <laughs> that was absolutely wonderful. Connie, thank you so much. Um, I just, I, well, first of all, I, I just want to express that I think what we just watched was this um, complete confluence of all your disciplines. So, you know, from the poetic quality of what you write to your thinking in both your PhD and your general research practice, and then also being able to, you know, see your artwork and then your backstories in terms of sharing with us your research. I mean, for me, that was incredibly generous. And I think, you know, for the audience, I'm so uh, please put your questions in because, you know, this type of um, talk is, it's so rich. There's so many entry points. And so I want to make sure that the audience has a chance to, um, to go there. So um, uh, I'll wait a little bit. Uh, Please, everybody, um, you know, put things in the in the chat. Okay, things are starting to come in. Um, uh, okay, first uh, question from Kenyatta. Connie, your lecture was absolutely amazing. Thank you so much. Can you speak to the inter integration of creative writing as a catalyst within your work and your data visualizations? And what is your dream for how we can go about repairing our relationship to the earth? histories and embracing seed time in relationship to eco-feminist politics. How do you see your work as functioning as a call to action during this time? Wow, that's an amazing question. And um, I feel like it's like the dreamiest sort of question I could possibly receive. And I worry that my response um, is inadequate <laughs> for such a good question. But um, yeah, I guess to uh, respond to the first part of um, Kenyatta's question. Uh, I think creative writing is a huge part of my practice. Um, it doesn't always surface, but it's a way for me to like, um, yeah, I guess like basically build out the world that, um, I mean, yeah, build out the world that I'm trying to develop. I think it makes, I think it's uh, definitely like crucial for when I'm working on a film project, like even if the, the stories that I write don't end up in the script, they, they can be used as source material for people I'm working with. Um, and uh, especially since I, I want to, you know, I'm interested in seeing how people respond to this frame. And I do think um, creative writing, or at least, yeah, just any sort of writing really is like, uh, it's a way to link into um, like existing tropes too, especially when you're writing sci-fi, like tropes that um, you may have a problem with actually. Like I find myself writing a lot of very, like this exact kind of sci-fi that I complain about um, and uh, you know, decry as problematic or like ideologically neoliberal, but it's, yeah, it's a way to sort of see like how I can like worm out from this like kind of established um, thing, this like organism that can still change. And I wanna figure out how to change it. Um, and yeah, sometimes that works by, that happens by working within the initial boundaries that you know. Um, yeah, and then the rest of your question, Kenyatta. Uh, 
And then the, um, the tail end was, how do you see your work as functioning as a call to action during this time? Mm -hmm. um, wow, I feel like I, I think, I don't know, I feel sort of like shy about thinking about my work as like a call to action. I feel like a call, I mean, I, I would hope that it's a call to action for people to consider how they think about um, like the idea of apocalypse or what they consider to be like a contaminating element. Um, and yeah, sorry, that's like, I'm, I think there's the like ideal way and then there's like, but I'm not sure like how it lands exactly, if that makes any sense. I, I feel like maybe, a, you know, a lot of artists wonder about this. It's like, well, here's the like ideal way that my work would serve as a call to action and somewhere near it, <laughs> hopefully, is uh, how it actually serves. But um, yeah, I think just like opening up questions, um, challenges to existing um, ideological formations, um, particularly around like what we view as uh, like a toxic or contaminated other. And um, yeah, and also just like how we want to, um, how we want to orient ourselves to the idea of an ecological apocalypse. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Um, all right, so uh, the next question. Um, thank you, Connie, wonderfully rich talk. You mentioned the petrochemical sublime in relation to Bertinsky. Can you speak more to the relationships between depictions of the politically questionable sublime and the abject, whether in your own work, popular culture, sci-fi or news media? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, well, I do feel like the pet, the petrochemical sublime, which is not a term that I coined, by the way, that's uh, TJ Demos, my advisor, <laughs> um, my PhD advisor, he, yeah, so like, I think the petrochemical sublime is uh, an aesthetic that we're actually very familiar with. We see it in a lot of sci-fi films. Um, we see it in, uh, I mean, just one example is, uh, it's that awful Matt Damon movie, um, Elysium, which is like this about this very stratified society. And, and there's this sort of like, um, you know, everything's like deeply, you know, everything's like very saturated, like all the people on earth live in these slums um, that are, that look a lot like, you know, like disaster photography. Um, and like for me, that kind of aesthetic is sort of pornographic. It's like, it really, um, you know, it kind of like wallops you with how striking it is, but it's, I feel like there's still like a distance, like an emotional distance there. It's almost like, oh, it's so beautiful. It's a work of art. Mm -hmm. And it's not something that I have to live with. And um, like, this is, uh, yeah. And so, and I, and I think like, I, yeah. And like that question of like, how do you mobilize like the sort of romantic qualities mm -hmm. of that aesthetic for this other, you know, for like a different political purpose. Like that's like a really, that's like an ongoing question that I have. And, um, and I guess this probably doesn't address uh, your question about the petrochemical sublime necessarily, but um, like one film that I actually think does like an amazing job of this is uh, Sorry to Bother You by Boots Riley. It's uh, like, I was just talking about this with some friends the other day. We were like, yeah, the marketing for the film did not address at all the ra its radical politics. You know, it's like, oh, it's, it's about a telemarketer, a black telemarketer who speaks in like a white voice. And that was like, the trailer, but then when you watch it, you're like, holy shit, this is actually about so much more. And it's also like beautifully done. You know, the aesthetics are very compelling. 
and exciting, but then it like sort of like swerves you into this whole other space you weren't expecting. So I think for me, that's like the ideal way for me to use um, that kind of aesthetic. Mm -hmm. I don't think I'm there yeah. yet, but yeah. Well, as you as you mentioned in your talk, it's it's really hard to counter those images, right? So the images like the, the sp spectacularly apocalyptic images are the images that draw the most eyes. And so, you know, any form of visual resistance to that has to kind of, you know, take up the um, either uh, like con oppositional aesthetics or embrace it in a different manner. So um, I'm gonna read off, there's another question. Um, uh, oh, okay, from Amanda. Uh, your question about seeds being dead or just sleeping feels so poignant right now. It fills me with hope thinking about that kind of longevity of spirit, even if dormant. Could you talk more about how you think about or incorporate ideas of hope and resilience into your work? Thanks. Um, thanks, Amanda. I love that question. Um, I, yeah, I feel like I, uh, when I'm working uh, when I'm making work, I try to use it as a way to like test out different pet, like possibilities, like hopeful possibilities without denying um, the, you know, some of the bleak parameters of our current situation and future. And so like, you know, when I think about, yeah, so for example, like for me, hope emits uh ecological disaster is like has to be linked into collectivity somehow and like it cannot like for me a situation where you're the only person left in your like survival bunker and like worrying about whether or not you'll be shanked by the psycho waiting outside you know that's like not to me like a hopeful situation for me <laughs> and so when i but then also these, you know, sort of like utopic visions of like, oh, we're all gonna, we're, everyone's gonna have, be wealthy and have, you know, 12 acres of land and it's gonna be great. Like, I, I don't think that's likely either, at least in the near future. And so, um, like, I'm like, okay, well, given what uh, scientists seem to say is likely, what are the best possible conditions? Mm -hmm. And for me, that's very much rooted in a political um, situation where you know there is universal health care, there's universal access to food, clean water, shelter, and um, like a decent standard of living. And and so yeah, I'm like, okay, well, what if if that's what hope looks like to me? How do I? How can a fic a fictitious work? help me get there and mm -hmm. uh yeah and i'll be honest like i have not been able to work on the film for the past few months during covid because it was like so apocalyptic feeling <laughs> but i'm you know i'm crawling out of the hole so thanks well it's kind of like <laughs> I'm, in in the introduction uh i i really um try to also focus on this notion that you know a lot of your work is about dreaming in many ways, you know, there's a kind of like the, the way that uh, people speak in the videos, as well as, you know, some of the, I guess, sort of like the slower or even kind of languid moments seem, you know, almost like, um, like, a like, trying to formulate or think of, you know, a different uh, space, or, you know, um, just kind of reconsidering what's actually happening. Um, so yeah, dreaming seems to be something that comes, you know, into play for me, at least when I think of your work. Um, I'm going to read one more question and uh, let's see. Uh, okay, from Christine. Thank you for sharing a thought provoking view of the world, combining commentary on environmentalism, climate change, capitalism, politics, culture, and identity. So much, it's so great. Uh, and centering it on something so physically small, but so literally and figuratively meaningful as a seed. What's next for your seed journey? Do you imagine taking it further, seeing how it will evolve post November elections and beyond, or might you transition to something new? Oh, thanks, Christine. Um, wow, these questions are so good. Um, the, yeah, 
Well, I feel, I have a feeling I'll be working on seeds like forever. They're, <laughs> I don't know. I mean, there's just so much there, you know, like the, like a lot of the artists that I mentioned, um, like, you know, yeah, including you, Stephanie, like your seed projects take forever. Like the, you know, <laughs> working with plants takes forever. You can't force them to do anything really. And like the, um, and just the, there's so much history there. And like, I mean, something that I thought about a lot while working on this map of seed migrations is that seeds, like the movement of seeds is really like a metaphor for the movement of people and capital um, through colonialism, which, yeah, I think you've, you're addressing in your um, empire gardens project. And so that, you know, and like, I feel like for a lot of the people I, I know or look at who work with seeds and plant material, they're like, like a lot of people work with a lot of really amazing projects that I've seen are just focused on one thing. It's like, like potatoes. <laughs> you know, it's like there's so much in potatoes or like corn that you could spend 12 years working on corn. And um, the, and as someone who loves to eat, it's like, I, I you know, <laughs> I'm constantly like, oh, that's, you know, that's exciting. Potatoes, like strawberries, whatever. And uh, the history behind each of the foods um, on our plate in our refrigerator is really fascinating. And um, yeah, and so, yeah, I feel like it's very generative. It's also like kind of this dream of mine to visit the seed, the global seed vault in Norway. Huh. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and the Millennium Seed Bank uh, at the Kew Gardens in uh, the UK. And from what I understand, both places are actually very hard to get access to. You have to like go through a lot of hoops. And, um, and so the logistical process of getting access to that might <laughs> might take me forever. So I'm expecting it to be a long journey. <laughs> yeah, well, again, like, you know, back to this idea of time. So like seed time is like constant, right? I mean, it's forever. It's like super, it's, it's incredibly deep time. It's constant. And then yet we're bumping up against this kind of accelerated time, right? Of like mm -hmm. environmental collapse and disaster. So it's interesting to think about, you know, having to spend so much time to invest in the research of these things that take so long, and yet we're up against, you know, a reality that's like hurtling forward incredibly fast. So it's, it's really amazing to see your work um, address that head on, but also just with a, a poetics. And I guess, um, I think I have one question uh, for you, which is that, um, I mean, do you ever find that um, based on your work, which is incredibly research driven, are there moments in which the research has to be sort of put aside to think about or um, absorb a kind of more intuitive stance? And how do you decide on when that happens? Because, you know, not to place them in sort of oppositions to each other, but they, cannot, they can be very different ways of working and thinking like through a body or through your hands or through your mind. And so how do you, um, how do you think about that balance? Mm -hmm. Yeah, totally. Um, yeah, that's a fantastic question. And it's something I definitely struggle with a lot. Um, I, yeah, I think uh, as someone who has, who falls back a lot on their writing and research practice, I'm very prone to like wanting to frame stuff and I'm very prone to like latching onto the meta narrative. Um, I think uh, actually a couple of years ago, Anne, Anne Walsh um, said something like, I can see like cognitive hijacking happening, right, you know, in this piece. And I was like, holy shit, that's so true. Like I'm constant, you know, there's constant cognitive hijacking happening. And so I think when I feel like, like really hijacked, like when it's like obvious to me that I've, my brain, you know, that I've been like mentally hijacked by myself, then um, I step away from the research and I'm like, okay, I'm just going to make some collages <laughs> or like, I'm just going to, or I'm going to, you know, I'm going to do some stuff. Yeah. I'm going to make small uh, work that I'll probably never show anyone. And, uh, and it's a way to just like loosen myself up. Um, so yeah, I think I feel it in my body. Like, like I feel like when I'm approach a project and I feel tight, uh, 
that's when I know, or that's a hint that. Uh -huh. To just let it go. Yeah. Or, or just become, yeah, somehow acknowledge too that you've probably absorbed all those ideas and thoughts and then they're gonna manifest in a totally unexpected or different way. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. Wow. Well, let's see. Do you want one more question? There actually, there's a lot. It's great. It's there's lots of people um, uh, really, yeah, throwing in questions. Are you uh, up for it? Yeah, I'll take I'll take one more. Thank you for the great questions, everyone, and thank you to, um, yeah, thank you to Stephanie for moderating and to Kenyatta for curating me into this series. Um, this is kind of interesting. Uh, okay, from uh, anonymous uh, question. You're so right in that our society is shifting towards looking at the beauty in a disaster to not reckon with the impact we are having on our climate future, et cetera. How do you think the current Asian slash American education systems can do a better job of building a resistance to this narrative or view amongst the next generations? And I wonder if maybe this is something, you know, thinking about your work uh, for a little bit as an educator, I'm just kind of extrapolating a little bit on this question here. Like, um, what can the education system do to counter any of the, uh, the this reckoning? Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, wow. That's such a good question. Um, I feel woefully unequipped to answer, but I'll try. I think, um, yeah, so earlier this year and late last year, um, I worked at the Exploratorium and I worked with a lot of kids uh, to, you know, just kind of talking about basic science. And it was always like, yeah, it was always amazing to me how, um, how much like, you know, the most, the most hyper energetic kid would stop to look at something as small, and boring seeming as a seed, if you just gave them a physical thing to look at. And, um, and also if you sort of like brought them in. And so I think like teaching, um, yeah, teaching people to like reconnect with their body and uh, the physical world around them, um, learning how to untether from devices mm -hmm. And the screen, I think, is like crucial. I, um, yeah, I'm. I feel like just like, yeah, just reconnecting to the body through um, whether that's mindfulness meditation in schools or other forms of slowing down or like walks, even like nature walks, in, you know, through schools. I think nature education is really important, like accessible nature education and um that yeah I mean I'm, I'm not a very seasoned educator I've just done it a little bit <laughs> so I don't really know what works or what doesn't but I uh yeah I was always really amazed by um the wonder uh, I always loved seeing the wonder on on people's faces when they just especially kids faces when they just like put down the phone and see something they've never seen before. Yeah, yeah. Well, we have a lot of, we have a, a big task in, in the sense of like, uh, we're both involved in the education system in different ways and, you know, trying to kind of create the, um, the, the, the uh, context and the, um, the space for the ideas that will get us to our, you know, uh, our futures that we are dreaming and hoping for. And again, I just wanna thank you, Connie, for this amazing talk. It's such a pleasure and it's such an honor to have you with us. Um, thank you to the amazing uh, folks who asked questions and uh, joined us tonight. And um, I'd like to thank uh, um, everyone at, uh, who has supported this program. And uh, I think we're, we're signing off now. So thank you very much. Yeah, thank you Thanks so much. Applause, everybody. Actually, how about this? Don't go just, yeah, everyone chat in. Just go, yeah. <laughs> applause, applause in the chat. That's amazing to see. Thank you so much. Have wow. a good night. Yeah, thank you, everyone. And thank you, Stephanie. Thank you, Kenyatta. Thank you, Paris, Maya, um, everyone who, yeah, who helped. So it's great you're all wonderful. You. Thank you all for being here. Good night. And congratulations, Connie.
Thanks.